Okay, welcome folks to another edition of Weapons and Warfare. For Straight Arrow News, I'm Ryan Robertson. We have a lot to get to this week. You'll find out what made me sick in National Harbor, Maryland. Our Weapon of the Week is really a threefer. And we'll wrap up the show with a lighthearted look at what the heck the White House is thinking. But, as we always do, let's begin with some news you may have missed. We start in Grafenvord, Germany, where around 500 Ukrainian soldiers are now training with American troops. This, as the second anniversary of Russia's full invasion into Ukraine nears. The job of training the Ukrainians falls to the 155th Armored Brigade from the Mississippi Army National Guard. The 155th recently took over for an Arkansas National Guard unit that oversaw the training of more than 7,500 Ukrainian troops over the past nine months. I would like to thank uh, Major General Tehran and the Ukrainian government for their trust in the United States government, the United States military, our NATO allies, um, our European Union allies, and the Thunder Brigade for allowing us to train your soldiers to help better prepare them for victory. With American funding for weapons and ammunition all but dried up from Washington, this kind of training remains one way the U.S. is able to continue helping Ukraine in its efforts to push back the Russian invasion. Tensions remain high on the border of North and South Korea. According to multiple reports, the North Koreans recently stoked the flames by firing artillery shells at the sea boundary between the two nations. For their part, the North Koreans admitted to firing nearly 100 rounds near the disputed boundary. However, they denied shooting an additional 60 rounds the following day. All of that was followed by multiple rounds of rhetoric from each side. And now an agreement reached in 2018 between the two nations is at risk. That was a deal to ease pressure on each country's defenses. Many experts point to South Korea's upcoming elections in April as motivation for the North to provoke the South. Clean energy. It's a term not often associated with the U.S. military. But there is an effort underway to change that. The U.S. Naval Research Laboratory is helping lead the charge to put hydrogen fuel cells to work. The lab and its partners are helping to develop hydrogen power units to power the Marine Corps' Stalker unmanned aircraft. So a hydrogen fuel cell is a device that takes hydrogen fuel and air from the environment, combines the two, and when you do that, you produce two things, electricity and water. Do it that way rather than burning it. The process is much more efficient and you get electricity directly. In addition to reducing carbon emissions, the appeal for operators can be seen in flights that are substantially longer than a battery-powered electric aircraft. The project could also help the Marine Corps reach their goal of reducing the need for liquid fossil fuel by 50% by 2025. Good luck, Marines. That's ambitious. Training. The word alone can send even the most enthusiastic of professionals running for cover. But not all training involves a beige conference room and a spread of stale donuts. For some soon-to-be pilots in the U.S. Air Force, the next evolution of training looks like something straight out of Ready Player One. So, up is left, down is right. It's the kind of setup that would also look right at home in a Dave & Buster's. This is nuts. For airmen training to become the Air Force's next generation of helicopter pilots, this augmented reality is the new reality of pilot training. So it's modeled off the TH-1H Huey helicopter, um, and it uses basically a combined virtual and mixed reality environment where students are able to train and actually flip switches and see their hands. The system has been in use by the Air Force for a few years now, and the people involved say the benefits abound. It best replicates the actual operational environment and allows us to provide essentially on-the-job training. We use it in all types of uh, profiles, be it emergency procedures training, instrument training, and then uh, eventually what we're trying to do is get it where we'll have multiple devices that can be paired together, they can fly in formation in the mission environment. Maybe the most obvious advantage? It's a more cost-effective way to get prospective pilots 
into a seat for meaningful hands-on training. If you think about the normal simulators, um, the big level D motion simulators, you know, those cost a lot of money for the Air Force. If we can have something, you can see it's a very small footprint, uh, we can put it in, in a student room and students are able to use it and have easy access to it. Uh, that's a big one for the Air Force. That training is also helping graduate student pilots at a faster rate. The first class to put this technology to use graduated a full six weeks ahead of schedule. You know, one of the truly great things about this multi-placed mixed reality trainer is the fact that it combines tactile feel with virtual reality. I have my cyclic, I have my collective, I have my tail rotor pedals, and then when I put on my goggles, I'm fully immersed in a both mixed and virtual reality. Ahead of me, I can see what appears to be the airfield, but I also have all of my equipment right here at my side. And if I wanted to, I could take off. The uh, head-mounted displays, HMDs, uh, have video pass-through with 4K cameras that, and we can distinguish what pixels are looking at the physical environment, what pixels should be fired as a virtual reality, and that allows us to seamlessly mesh the physical environment, physical hands, switches with a virtual reality out the window view. In 2021, the Air Force overhauled its helicopter training program. Since the early 1990s, helicopter pilots had to complete fixed wing training before moving on to helicopter training. That old requirement is now no longer in place. And the reason behind that is you're focusing on core competencies of being a helicopter pilot. I don't need to teach a helicopter pilot how to go upside down or do anything like that. Fortunately, you know, that would be very bad if he did. So by teaching them how to hover and the operation of flying a helicopter early on, that saves us lots of time, which translates to money overall. So we've really uh, revitalized our pipeline. It's a change, at least in part, the Air Force hopes will lure more prospective pilots to sign on the dotted line. A recent report in the San Antonio Express News detailed the branch's shortfall of 2,000 pilots. It's a problem that's pushing Air Force leaders to get approval for five- and six-figure retention bonuses. While that's not something immediately available, the opportunity to train with the latest technology is. I think this approach is really going to revolutionize aviation training in general. Once we can get to the level where we can get FAA certification, it will create the ability where now pilots don't have to travel to a centralized training facility. We can, because they're lightweight, low cost, we can put this locally and so pilots can get their check rides and simulators in their own neighborhoods, spend more time generating revenue flights, and so we're going to see Greater access to training makes better pilots. The technology behind the mixed reality trainer really is something to behold. When I had the chance to experience it at the AFA's Airspace Cyber 2023 conference, it felt so real I actually got a little nauseous and had to go outside for some fresh air. So while I have all the respect in the world for our USAF Hilo pilots, it's a safe bet to say that I will never be one of them. You know, the holidays may be over, but that isn't stopping some of America's ground troops from getting a new little something in 2024. No, no, I want an official red under cover and I shoot you in a chair with my leg rifle. You'll shoot your eye out, kid. No, not the Red Rider. Instead, it's something with a bit more kick. Meet the M7 and the M250, both built by Sig Sauer. After more than two years of testing and evaluations, they were selected as the next generation of rifles for America's close contact troops. Add to that the M157 fire control made by Vortex Optics, and Uncle Sam's frontline foot soldiers will be armed with weapons that should be a significant step up from their predecessors, the M4 and the M249. The M7, known through the testing phase as the XM5 and then the XM7, beat out competition from General Dynamics OTS and Textron Systems to become the long-awaited replacement for the M4 and its predecessor, the M16. On the surface level, the change to the M7 might be a bit of a head-scratcher for some. It's longer, weighs more, and carries fewer rounds. But military brass say the change from a 5.56 round to the new 6.8mm cartridge will help improve accuracy, range, and stopping power. 
Add to that, the new rounds can reportedly penetrate Russian and Chinese body armor, and it appears the military's frontline combat troops could soon have an added advantage when the bullets start flying. Next up, the M250, replacing the M249 saw, or squad automatic weapon. Coming in at a full four pounds less than its predecessor, the M250 is a major leap forward for several reasons. It's more ergonomic, has an improved gas system, and fires the same cartridge as the M7. With an improved bipod made of titanium and an easier loading operation, it's a user-friendly weapon almost right out of the box. Just how friendly, you ask? Well, a soldier with the Army's 75th Ranger Regiment said, I would certainly take this weapon into combat today. This feels like a huge upgrade as far as ergonomics of controls, recoil management, and ease of manipulation over the M249. And that brings us to what many are calling the real game changer, the M157 fire control system. The name is kind of confusing. The optic and its operation are not. In the simplest terms, it's a high-tech scope and communication system designed to improve the skill level of anyone using it. With the push of a button, the M157 can range a target, factor in environmental changes, and then give the operator a shooting solution. By combining the latest tech with actual optics, the M157 increases the range of effectiveness by hundreds of meters. For all of the high-tech elements, though, the makers of the M157 don't want you calling it a smart scope. Because should the power in the unit fail, the optics are still usable, which is kind of a big deal in a firefight, but that's a just-in-case feature. Built with smaller and more robust parts, the idea is the M157 will be as rugged and reliable as the rifle it sits on. So what can users expect? In a fraction of a second, the fire control system can sense direction, wind, elevation, and bullet drop, allowing the operator to put sights on the enemy in the blink of an eye. It also has the ability to connect with other devices to share the picture the operator is looking at or receive images and information from other team members, giving the user a clearer picture of the battlefield. As far as who gets the new stuff first, the Army says it's planning for the 101st Airborne to be the first equipped with the new generation squad weapons by March of this year. All right, folks, it's time in the show that we call comms check. It's our opportunity to kind of check in with you, the viewers. Uh, we, we scan our social media accounts, look for a comment. Uh, to either a question that we didn't answer or just something that we would like to uh, point out. So, without further ado, let's get started. First comms check this week comes to us from a story that we did on Operation Prosperity Guardian. This is the U.S. Naval operation that started back in December uh, to protect um, shipping in the Red Sea. Uh, Houthi rebels uh, were attacking vessels, commercial uh, uh, shipping vessels in the Red Sea uh, in solidarity with uh, their quote-unquote, brothers in Gaza, as the Houthis said. So, the question comes from Diogenes, I think is how we're going to just go ahead and pronounce that uh, handle there. But uh, Diogenes says, we give a military operation a name, and then we simply pretend like we're doing something while we don't do anything, shaking my head. Well, Diogenes, I was with you for a long time, if I'm being honest. Uh, operation Prosperity Guardian started back, like I said, in December. Um, the U.S. said that there were 20 uh, partner nations, although half of those nations didn't even want to be named. Uh, the Houthis had launched um, dozens of attacks against commercial vessels, commercial vessels, excuse me, uh, and had also um, most recently launched attacks against U.S. naval vessels. Now, up until uh, this past weekend, Diogenes, uh, Prosperity Guardian hadn't really done much. In fact, many of the partners had kind of, of uh, just decided to go their own way, protect their own ships, looking at you, France. Um, but over the weekend, the U.S. and the U.K. and a few other nations, uh, Australia, Canada, the Netherlands, and Bahrain, they all partnered together and kind of kicked the crap out of a lot of Houthi, uh, Houthi strongholds. Um, they used uh, F-A-18 Super Hornets, um, three U.S. destroyers, one British destroyer is launching Tomahawk missiles, um, a, more than 150 munitions total, uh, took out 60 targets at 28 different locations. So, uh, 
for, for a while, the U.S. kept warning the Houthis, stop it, stop it, stop it, or, or, or else. Um, the Houthis didn't take the warning, and now the or else happened. Is this the last or else? Uh, I kind of think that remains to be seen. A lot of it depends on how the Houthis respond to getting smacked in the face. Uh, of note are the targets. Now, the targets were a lot of radar sites and some of the launch sites, as well as the uh, manufacturer facilities of these weapons that the Houthis were launching, the drones uh, and the missiles. So if their production facilities have been taken out, it stands to reason that their strikes will probably diminish, although the Houthis are completely backed by Iran. So if Iran comes in and says, here's a bunch more weapons, well, then uh, it's going to require some more strikes. Um, but to answer your question, Diogenes, yes, for a while, Prosperity Guardian hadn't really been doing much. Now it seems that uh, the, the U.S. and the U.K., and like I said, Australia, Canada, the Netherlands, and Bahrain have decided enough was enough and gave the Houthis a little bit of uh, freedom when they might not have been requesting it. The next uh, um, comms check that we have comes to us from a story that we were doing on Russian losses uh, and kind of the, the tenuous place that the Russian military finds itself in in Ukraine. Um, Caleb Mahoney said, Russia's goal has already been met. They are simply holding the lines now as their goal has already been met. Under no metric can you spin this to say they are losing, they already won. Uh, and this is a response. In, in the video, um, I said that Russia was losing the ground war because militaristically they are losing and they have not accomplished the goals that they set out. Uh, what are those goals? As I switch my notes here. Um, Russia, Vladimir Putin said very early on that Russia had three primary goals. Subjugate Ukraine, replace the uh, government there, and annex uh, large swaths of the country as Russian. Uh, essentially create like another little Belarus uh, that they can vacation in from time to time. That's not happened. Uh, the, the Ukrainian government still stands. Volodymyr Zelensky, still the president, uh, still leading Ukraine. And the areas that Russia tried to annex, the four areas to the east, um, those are very still contested heavily and not under Russian control by any stretch of the imagination. This is a fact. This isn't me saying this. This is facts on the ground, Caleb. So um, that's not me spinning it. That's just the way the, the situation is. Now, if you want to talk about who's winning the war, though, then you can start getting into the idea of the theory of victory. And for that, I would steer you towards a, a uh, Dutch military um, um, officer who wrote a piece for the Institute from or the Modern War Institute. That author's name is Marnix Provost. And to sum up uh, the, the paper that they wrote, essentially, Russia doesn't necessarily need to win on the battlefield in order for the world to perceive that Russia was able to win against the West and NATO if they can somehow turn the stalemate in Ukraine into a ceasefire that Russia is able to hold on to any ground gain. Um, while it might not be an outright victory, uh, it would be, you know, in, in the eyes of, of Russia, Russia propagandists, and Russia's uh, uh, puppet regimes around the world, that would be a victory. So, Caleb, uh, militaristically, Russia is losing, but they can afford to because they have more resources on the whole. They might be winning uh, the, the propaganda war or the, the theory of victory, if you will. So thank you for your questions, folks. Really appreciate it. Uh, who knows? Maybe next week it'll be your comments. So wherever you're watching, however you're watching, um, comment below. And then maybe next week uh, your comment will be featured right here on Comms Check. All right, folks, it's time again for Ryan's Wrap. This week we're talking Attackums, Ukraine, and trying to figure out what the heck is the White House thinking. I ask that question because as I record this segment in early January, the U.S. has several hundred Attackums missiles designated for disposal because, like your mama's day-old casserole, they're hitting their expiration date. But you can't just toss these things into the garbage. And the disposal process is expensive. It would be cheaper to just give the weapons to Ukraine and let them force feed some freedom into the old Russian military. But let's back up just a little bit. The Attackums, which is short for 
Army Tactical Missile System is one of America's weapon of choice on the battlefield. They come in several different varieties, including cluster munitions and unitary warhead. The clusters are good against troops and light armor. Unitary warheads work well on hard targets like buildings, bunkers, and bridges. As soon as the war in Ukraine broke out, Volodymyr Zelensky, the president there, started asking for attackums. The U.S. has around 1,100 or so of the cluster-style attackums on hand, and the Army's new precision strike missile, which is replacing the attackums, just went operational. So it's not like the U.S. needs to keep the older and soon-to-be outdated weaponry. The White House did eventually send a handful of the cluster-style attackums to Ukraine last October, and when I say handful, I mean less than 20. Ukraine is really good about getting the biggest bang for the buck, though, and used those attackums to take out 14 Russian attack helicopters at two different airfields. Ukraine also proved its ability to attack the Kerch Bridge, a key supply line to Russian troops, so imagine what they could do if they got their hands on, say, a few hundred attackums. I am certainly not alone in questioning the White House's motivation here. If the goal is to help Ukraine win the war and do so on a budget, it makes logistical and financial sense to send Ukraine the attackums. It's the same argument that was made for tanks and jets. The U.S. has more than it can use. Better and newer versions are being made. And instead of trying to maintain those systems, a lot of the time it's just cheaper to give the stuff to an ally. Now, I know the most common response from the White House is President Biden does not want to risk an escalation with Russia. But we are two years into this war. The West already crossed several of Russia's red lines. And as I've reported on before, Putin knows if he pulls the nuclear trigger, Russia as a country is over and his time in power is done. Yes, on the whole, I agree we should be concerned with Russia trying to escalate things. However, we, as in those of us in the modern industrial world, also need to be concerned about escalation from other bad actors who see what's happening in Ukraine and think, hey, maybe we should try that here. But what do you think? Let us know in the comments, and maybe next week we'll feature yours during comms check. In the meantime, though, for senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphic designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson with Weapons and Warfare, signing off. Ooh.